Hi, welcome back to our next video in our anatomy and physiology uh, video series. In this video, we'll go over chapter number nine, uh, the nervous system, the body's control center. Now, this video will be one of the longer ones in the series because we cover so much detail uh, with the nervous system. Uh, first off, a brief introduction. Uh, the nervous system is a complex uh, body system that controls many of your body's uh, everyday functions. It helps to monitor uh, conditions and help to take corrective actions if that's necessary in order to keep everything running smoothly. Now another control system that we'll talk about in a future video is the endocrine system. And they're control systems because they receive information from our various senses. Now, like any uh, control system, uh, they're large and complex and very intricate and sometimes uh, difficult to understand. So you must keep track of everything that's happening in your body. So sometimes the systems themselves are the most complex and vital systems. Right, our learning objectives for, for this chapter, list and describe the components and basic operation of the nervous system, uh, contrast the central and peripheral nervous systems, uh, define the parts and functions of the nerve tissue, uh, discuss the anatomy and physiology of the spinal cord, right, organize the hierarchy of the nervous system, I'll be able to locate and define the external and internal structures of the brain and their corresponding functions. Uh, describe the sensory and motor functions of the brain with related structures. Uh, contrast the parasympathetic and sympathetic branches of the autonomic nervous system. And lastly, uh, discuss some representative diseases of the nervous system. All right, first, we'll talk about uh, some parts and some basic operations. When we talk about the nervous system, there are uh, various divisions that make up the system in general because it covers so much uh, material, so much uh, control over your body is divided into divisions and those divisions have uh, separate divisions also but there are two main divisions of the nervous system the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system now the brain and the spinal cord are the central nervous system so anything beyond that is considered a part of the peripheral nervous system so any cranial nerve any peripheral nerve that branches off the spinal cord all those are under the umbrella of the peripheral nervous system or PNS but the central nervous system is just the brain and the cord itself, nothing else. And the input side of the nervous system is the sensory system. Now, whenever you are receiving sensory information, whatever you are seeing, whatever you are hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, all that is sensory information. That's information that gets sent to the brain. Now, the output side of the nervous system is the motor system. So, for example, being able to see a glass of water is input going or information going into your brain. Reaching out and grabbing it and drinking it, that's a motor function. So that's the output side of the nervous system. And it's the somatic nervous system that controls the skeletal muscle and the voluntary movements. Uh, the prefix soma means body. So any kind of voluntary movement would be under this branch, the somatic nervous system. Now things that happen automatically without your conscious control is under the autonomic nervous system. So think of autonomic as being controlled automatically. You know, cardiac muscle, uh, glands, digestion, respiration, uh, movement of smooth muscle. That's all stuff that goes on without you really thinking about it. It happens automatically. So that falls under the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is further divided into two divisions. And they have exactly opposite effects of one another. The sympathetic and parasympathetic. The parasympathetic division is what will maintain your normal uh, body functions and the maintenance of homeostasis. And the sympathetic nervous system is what's called the fight or flight response system. Whenever you're in an, in an, an emergency situation, and the sympathetic division will take over. But your normal day-to-day -day living is controlled and monitored by the parasympathetic system. All right, here's so your overall uh, flow chart of all the, uh, the branches. Of course, up here you have the nervous system in general. The two major divisions, central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord, which are the structures in uh, this red color, and also the peripheral nervous system, uh, the PNS, which is all the nerves that branch off of the cord and off of the brain. That's all the structures in this green color. And the peripheral nervous system is divided into the somatic or voluntary nervous system, which is what controls voluntary skeletal muscle, and the autonomic nervous system, things that happen automatically without your control over. And that is further divided into the parasympathetic and sympathetic branch. So your daily maintenance is done by the parasympathetic and the sympathetic is your alert system when, in, when you're in an emergency situation where you have to react without thinking. That's the sympathetic branch. I will right, we'll go over a pretty typical real-life example here. 
uh, you park your car and you get out to visit a friend. As you step out onto the walk, a very large dog starts barking and snarling at you. Your, your sensory system will gather information, including a very large, unfriendly dog who's growling at you and staring you down. And you are out of your car so you aren't being protected and there's no one around to help. So information goes into your spinal cord and into your brain to process information so you make a quick decision. It tells you that you're in danger and you gotta do something. So the central nervous system will send directions to organs to gear up for a an emergency response via the autonomic nervous system. So in this situation, your heart rate will increase, your blood pressure will increase, uh, respiration rate will increase, you begin to sweat, the pupils will uh, dilate, more blood is delivered to the skeletal muscles and to the heart in order to respond so you can either stay in fight or turn around and flee. This is where the fight or flight phrase comes into play here. And stuff that you can't control. All this is involuntary. So whenever you're in a situation like this where you have to make a very split decision, all this is done by the sympathetic nervous system. So in addition to all this, the somatic nervous system will get the skeletal muscles ready you know, to help you, you know, get out of that situation. This is why it's called the fight or flight. If you can control your fear, you will slowly back away from the situation. But if you are scared out of your mind, you can turn around and run as fast as you can. Either way, the goal is to remain unharmed. And these are decisions that are made in a very split second without you thinking. All right, now we'll move on to uh, nerve tissue. Now there are specialized cells in the nervous system. Uh, they're called neuroglia or glial cells. And these glial cells are the uh, supporting cells of the nervous system. Uh, the central nervous system has four types and the peripheral nervous system will have two. And each one has their own uh, very specialized function. In the central nervous system, uh, the first one is astrocytes. And they're called astrocytes because they look like stars. That's why it has the term astro a part of its name. They look like little stars. And these offer uh, metabolic and structural support to the, the main uh, nervous tissue. These are the cells that also form the blood-brain barrier. So pathogens can't get from the blood into your brain all that easily. Some things can, can get through, but most things can't get through this barrier. Uh, next kind, the microglia. These will attack microbes and remove any cellular debris, you know, kind of cleaning, cleaning up the clutter around cells that shouldn't be there. Uh, next one, uh, ependymal cells. These are what will cover and line the cavities of the nervous system. And these are the cells that also make the cerebrospinal fluid. And lastly, uh, oligodendrocytes. These make a very special uh, lipid insulation called myelin, and we'll discuss myelin in more detail uh, here in a few minutes. Now, the peripheral nervous system has two uh, supporting cells with two types of glial cells. Uh, Schwann cells, these are cells that make myelin, but only in the peripheral nervous system. Schwann cells and oligodendrocytes have exactly the same function, but one is in the central nervous system and one's in the peripheral nervous system. And lastly, the satellite cells, these are the uh, supporting and nourishing cells for the peripheral nervous system. An example of all six of these, of course these four here are the ones in the central nervous system, ones you would find in the brain and the spinal cord only. The astrocyte here, uh, see epidymal cells up here, oligodendrocytes here, the microglia right here, and then two that are found in the peripheral nervous system, the Schwann and the satellite cells. The Schwann cells here, and satellite cells around the main nervous tissue. All of your control functions of the nervous system are carried out by the main functional unit of the nervous system. They're called neurons. So all these supporting cells we just talked about, all six of those go to support neurons. The neurons are very bizarre looking cells and have uh, multiple processes or multiple branches that come off of their main cell body. And they look to almost have a tail, but it's not really a tail. Now each part of the neuron has a very particular function. The main cell body is where you have element of cell metabolism. Also where you'll find the, uh, the neuron's uh, nucleus. Uh, you have dendrites. These are the branches that will receive information from the environment. So information will go from the dendrites into the cell body to be processed. Once it's processed, information gets sent out of the cell body through an, a process called an axon. So information how nerves talk to one another and talk to other tissues, information is carried along axons. Now at the very end of these axons, you have what's called an axon terminal. Now, terminal means you know, the ending or the end point. This is where the signal will actually leave the neuron to go and travel to a next, another tissue or another cell. Then you have the uh, synapse. This is where the axon terminal and the receiving cell combine. This is actual space 
how nerves talk to one another, how nerves talk to other tissues. All right, so here's an example, a very standard uh, type of neuron here. This main part here is the cell body, of course the cell nucleus here. All these extensions here look like roots of a tree. These are all dendrites. So information will go into these extensions and travel into the cell body to get processed. Once that's processed, information that gets sent out of the cell body through an axon. That will go on to a target organ or a target tissue or to another neuron. Now neurons can be classified by how they look or by what they do. So they can be either classified by their function or by their structure. Now input neurons are known as sensory neurons. So information going to the brain. They're known as sensory neurons. And neurons that take information out of the brain or away from the brain are called motor neurons. That's because information going into your brain is due to sensory input. Anything that you see, anything that you hear, smell, taste, touch, all that is sensory info going from the external environment to your brain to be processed. That's information going into the brain, or these are also called afferent neurons. They're going to the brain. Then when your body needs to act, it sends out a signal out of the brain through motor neurons. Motor is always a reference to motion or movement. Those are also called efferent neurons. Now these types of neurons can uh, talk between each other. Their structure is called interneurons. Inter means between. These are also called association neurons. So these are how motor neurons and sensory neurons talk to one another. All right, now we'll talk about how neurons work. This is a fairly involved process. All right, so our neurons are also known as excitable cells. And this simply means that if a cell is stimulated, it can carry a small electrical charge within it. Now, each time a charged particle flows across the cell membrane, there's a tiny charge that gets generated. All three of the muscle types we've talked about previously, the smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, skeletal muscle, all those are excitable cells, and just as many gland cells are. And cells are really nothing more than really miniature batteries. And they're able to generate tiny currents simply by changing how permeable their cell membranes are. Now, a cell that is not excited or not stimulated is considered to be a resting cell. It's also said to be polarized. And it's called polarized because there is a difference in charge across the cell membrane. The inside of the cell is more negative compared to the outside of the cell. When that cell gets stimulated, you have sodium channels in the cell membrane will start to open up. And this allows uh, sodium ions to travel across the membrane. Now, sodium ions are positively charged, so the cell becomes more positive as they enter. So the more sodium enters, the more positive the inside of the cell becomes. Now a cell that has become uh, more positive is now depolarized. Now these sodium gates will close after a few minutes and then potassium gates will open. Potassium will now leave the cell, taking its positive charge with it. Now, this is called repolarization. It's going back to normal. If a cell becomes more negative when it's resting, this is called hyperpolarized. And this whole process is called an action potential, or AP. It's when a cell goes from being depolarized and then repolarized and also hyperpolarization. Uh, now when a cell gets excited or stimulated, it can't receive another stimulus until it goes back to its resting state. And this short time frame is called the refractory period. Uh, there are a lot of images here, but we'll go over them each briefly. This first image up here is a resting potential. You have sodium ions, the Na+, outside of the cell. Then you have the potassium ions, or K+, inside of the cell. Even though they're both, both positively charged ions, because there's more positive ions outside versus inside of the cell, the inside of the cell relative to outside is considered to be more negative. And actually the voltage in a resting cell around negative 70 millivolts, which is why that's here. When the cell gets stimulated, what you get is sodium channels will start to open up slowly, and it causes really a domino effect. Now, this section will stimulate this section will stimulate that section and keeps going down and down and down all the way down the, uh, the cell membrane. So when you get these sodium channels start to open, the inside of the cell becomes more positive or you can also think of it as being less negative. So that's why you get this slow arch here. Now instead of being at negative 70, you get to negative 65, negative 60, and so on. And it gets more and more positive until you get to this point here, the threshold potential. At this point, a large number of sodium channels open up all at the same time. So you get a very large influx of sodium ions. That massive 
influx causes a very a very large spike in voltage. So you go from say a negative 50 millivolts to about a positive 45 or so. So it's a very large rushing in or a, a depolarization of the membrane. After that happens, the sodium channels will now close, so no more can come in, and the potassium channels will open. And potassium is pumped out to get back to its normal resting state. So that's called repolarization, re going going back to normal. And sometimes instead of going to the negative 70 uh, voltage like it is here, sometimes it overshoots that value. It goes to negative 80, negative 90. That's called hyperpolarization. It's going beyond what it should. And after that corrects itself, it goes back to its normal resting potential at, of negative 70. And all this is due to a or due to the flow of ions in and out of the cell membrane, where you are normally resting at negative 70. Slight increase, slight increase. You get to that negative 55 point, which is at this point the neuron uh, will fire the impulse. You can't get to this point and not fire. It either happens or it doesn't happen. And this is an all or nothing thing like muscle contraction. It happens or it doesn't happen. You know, the lights are on, the lights are off. You know, you're pregnant, you're not pregnant. There's no middle ground here. So once you get to that value of negative 55 millivolts, it's where you get a ton of sodium channels throw themselves open all at once, allowing a, a big massive influx of sodium ions where you get the depolarization. Once you get to here, they all slam shut so no more can come in. And then potassium is kicked out to reset the balance. And when you do that, you go back to, you become more and more negative and to the point where you go beyond where you started from. That's why it's called hyperpolarization. Now, neurons can use their ability to generate electricity to send or receive or even interpret signals. You know, if you hit your thumb with a hammer, uh, dendrites in your thumb are stimulated by this blow and sodium channels open. Sodium flows into dendrites and they become depolarized and a number of cells that are affected are going to be depending on how hard you hit your thumb. And like we mentioned a second ago with the action potential, this is an all or nothing process. Either the cell has it or it doesn't. And once it starts, it will always finish and will always be the same size. Then there's something called a local potential. This is where the, the size of the stimulus will determine the excitement of the cell. So many sensory cells work via local uh, potentials, which is how the, your brain and spinal cord will determine the size of an environmental change. So the more cells that are stimulated, the more response you'll get. Now the dendrites will carry uh, depolarization to the sensory neuron cell body, which will take information and generate action potential if the stimulus is large enough. Now the speed of the impulse uh, conduction is determined by the diameter of the axon and also the presence of myelin. Now myelin is a, a special kind of lipoprotein that acts as a insulator that wraps around the axons. It's found both in the central nervous system and the uh, peripheral nervous system. And the nerves that are covered with myelin are, are white in color. And ax or axons that are not covered in myelin are called gray. They have a grayish color. That's where you get the gray matter and white matter in the brain reference from. The myelin is essential for the fast flow of action potentials down an axon. In an unmyelinated axon, the action potential can only flow down an axon by depolarizing each and every millimeter of an axon. So you have to cover the entire length of the axon for the information to reach the very, very end of it, which is still a fast process, but by comparing it to a myelinated axon, relatively slow. In myelinated axons, there are sections called uh, nodes that are located periodically, that, and only the nodes must depolarize. So what you get is the impulse jumping from node to node to node which makes the impulse go a lot, lot faster in axons that are covered with myelin. Here's what I mean by that. Dendrites here, cell body here, the axon here. And these sheaths of myelin are there to, not only to protect the axon, increase the speed of the conduction of the impulse. So instead of traveling the entire length of the axon here, the impulse only has to go from here, it jumps to here, it jumps to here, and here, and it leaps down from node to node to node until it reaches the very end of the axon. This is called saltatory conduction because that's a reference to leaping. Now the diameter of the axon will also in affect the speed of the action potential. The wider the diameter of the axon, the faster the flow of ions. So for an everyday example, think of a, a busy uh, interstate or a busy highway. If the highway is normally, say, four lanes, it can only carry so many cars. If that were to, say, triple in size or triple in diameter, you'd be able to get a lot more cars 
at the same time. So the wider the diameter, the more space you have for information to be carried. So the so the larger diameters and the myelination will make up a will make a very large difference in the overall speed of the action potential. Now small unmyelinated neurons can have speeds as low as half a meter per second, whereas a axon that is large in diameter and covered in myelin can have a speed of 100 meters per second. So that's 200 times faster. Just because you're changing the diameter of the axon and the presence of myelin. All right, now we'll talk about a pathology connection. We'll talk about some disorders with myelin. And probably the most well-known one is MS, multiple sclerosis. This is a disorder where the myelin in the central nervous system is destroyed. So in the areas without myelin, the impulse conduction is slow or almost impossible at some points. Now these areas of damaged myelin often have plaques or scarred areas. So not only are you slowing or completely stopping the impulse of being carried on the axon, you are basically exposing the axon to being, being attacked and developing scar tissue and being slowly destroyed. Now the cause of MS is probably an autoimmune condition and the symptoms will vary depending on where the patient's myelin has been damaged. Now, some possible symptoms include vision disturbances, balance, uh, speech, uh, movement. Now, there are multiple types of MS. Uh, the first one, relapsing remitting. This is characterized by a symptomatic flare-up called a relapse, followed by periods of time where the symptom is asymptomatic called a remission. So there's a constant back and forth. You're having a flare-up, then going for a long period of time with no symptoms at all. You can also have a chronic progressive. This has no remission periods at all patients become more and more disabled over time. Now most patients are initially diagnosed with relapsing remitting, but at least half of those will progress to the more serious form, the chronic progressive form. Right, MS is going to be more common in women and diagnosed most often in uh, people who are under 50 years old. A diagnosis for MS will be based on the history of the symptom uh, flare-ups and also the presence of plaques on the MRI, but there's no definitive diagnosis. A treatment Unfortunately, there's no cure for MS. In an, uh, an acute flare-up, uh, symptoms can be treated with steroids or plasma exchange or intravenous uh, IgG, immunoglobulin G. Uh, immunosuppressant drugs can also use to uh, decrease the frequency of the relapses or also to prevent or slow the conversion from relapsing remitting to chronic progressive. But unfortunately, there is no cure for MS. You can manage symptoms, but there's no set cure for it. Right, another myelin disorder, uh, Guillain-Barre. Say a disorder that's caused by an autoimmune attack on the myelin and on the axons in the peripheral nervous system. Uh, some common symptoms, weakness in the, in the limbs, uh, face, and diaphragm. And one of the key indicating factors of uh, Guillain-Barre is the ascending paralysis. You lose function you know, starting in your feet and your lower legs, and that paralysis will eventually get higher and higher up in the body until it reaches the diaphragm where it can be very serious. The cause of Guillain-Barre is unknown, but many patients who develop Guillain-Barre develop it after having a viral infection. Now, the course of disease has uh, three phases. The first one, the acute phase, is the initial onset of the disease. This is where the patient will become steadily worse. Then you have a plateau phase, which is a period of a few days to sometimes a few weeks, where a patient's condition stabilizes. Then you have the recovery phase, the period in which uh, the patient will start to recover function. Now, some recover full function, over a period of you know, one to two years. A, a significant portion of patients with severe cases have a measurable disability even two years after recovery. A diagnosis for uh, Guillain-Barre is based mostly on the history of a rapid onset, especially of the ascending paralysis, you know, just after having a viral infection. And there are tests that are, that are helpful in diagnosing uh, this condition, such as an EMG or cerebrospinal fluid analysis, which will show a high protein count but no white blood cells. The treatment for this uh, condition as will consist of uh, supportive care until symptoms are uh, either resolved or at least improved. Uh, this care could include uh, ventilation support, uh, prevention of blood clots, and bed sores, pain medication, and many patients will need rehab at some level after their uh, peripheral nervous system re fully recovers. All right, now we'll talk about uh, how synapses work. These are how neurons uh, talk to each other and talk to other tissues. You know, we talked about the action potential before as it travels down the axon. Well, at some point, it's going to reach the very end of that axon. It can't just go on forever. It will reach the axon terminal, you know, the end point of that axon. So when the action potential gets to this point, the presence of that action potential causes calcium channels to open. Well, this, cause, this will cause calcium ions to flow into the end of the axon. As the calcium flows into the axon, 
This will cause vesicles that contain neurotransmitters inside them to release those neurotransmitters. And all these steps are based off of something leading to it. You know, if step number two isn't there and the steps three, four, five don't happen. So everything has to be present in order for the process to move forward. If one part of this whole thing isn't there, then the process stops. So if calcium isn't here, then the synapse doesn't happen. The action potential will just stop. So everything has to be here for this to work properly. So it's these neurotransmitters that will diffuse across the space between that axon and the target cell. And this is called the synapse. Now these neurotransmitters will bind to uh, receptors on the uh, receiving cell. Now if the impulse is still great enough, the action potential will be created on the target cell and it will continue on in the target cell. And the last step of this transfer of information is the, cl the cleaning up or the removing of the neurotransmitter from that synapse to prevent it from uh, binding to the receiving cell over and over and over again. Now the use of neurotransmitters is called a chemical synapse because you're involving chemicals to carry information from one cell to another. Okay, here we have two neurons, A and B. So we'll focus just on right here. Step number one, you have the impulse traveling down, traveling down the axon to the action potential. So once you get the action potential going down to the very end part here, that will cause calcium channels to open up. So calcium ions will flow into the region. The presence of that calcium will cause these vesicles, these clear circles, that have neurotransmitters inside. That will cause them to migrate toward the cell membrane and then eject its neurotransmitters out. That's what's going on right here. And then the neurotransmitters will diffuse across this space here. It's called the synaptic cleft. And these neurotransmitters will bind to receptors on the target cell. It could be a muscle, it could be another neuron, it could be a gland, it could be anything. So if the stimulus is high enough on the target cell, then the action potential will continue here and continue the same process. And the last step would be to mop up all the neurotransmitters here because you don't want that to be hanging around for too long. And is this space, this area here, is how many drugs, both legal and illegal, target. Because this can greatly impact how a neurotransmitter works or greatly lower its impact, depending on what drug you're taking. We'll talk about that in more detail. But this is how neurons talk to one another, this process here. This whole process is the synapse. Now, our understanding of a chemical synapse has led to several breakthroughs regarding the treatment of mental illnesses. Many medications that are on the market today are based on how to modify synapses, you know, how they work in the synaptic cleft. Some drugs like SSRIs, uh, selective serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitors, is a very good example. These medications prevent the cleanup of the neurotransmitter serotonin in synapses, which will increase the effect of serotonin on the receiving cell. People who are clinically depressed are so because not enough serotonin is either being made or being received by the target cell. So if you keep serotonin in that space longer, it will improve that person's overall mood because it has more of a chance to bind to a target cell. So many antidepressants and many anti-anxiety drugs are SSRI. And the whole goal is to increase the level of serotonin to make the person happier. There are a large number of neurotransmitters. There's a table with a few. Not only uh, we have their name, where they're from, uh, what their function is, and some comments about each one. Acetylcholine, very, very important neurotransmitter where you find in uh, neuromuscular junctions with uh, skeletal muscle. Also plays a key role with, also plays a role with uh, Alzheimer's uh, treatments, uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine. These are hormones, but they also can function as neurotransmitters. All right, now some cells uh, do not need chemicals to transmit information from one cell to another. Now these are called electrical synapses because they are transferring information freely because they have special connections called gap junctions. Now these kinds of connections can exist between two types of excitable cells. A good example of this are the muscle fibers in the cardiac muscle type. These are found within the intercalated discs of the cardiac tissue. I now talk about the spinal cord and uh, spinal nerves. Now, the spinal cord is a hollow tube that runs inside the uh, vertebral column from the, the hole at the base of the skull, the frame and magnum, to the second lumbar vertebrae, or L2. Now, the spinal cord is really a uh, sophisticated neural information superhighway. Uh, there are 31 segments or 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Each one of these is named for its corresponding vertebrae. Now, the spinal cord ends at L2 and a very um, 
pointy structure called the conus uh, medullaris. And hanging from this structure is something called the uh, cauda equina. And it's called that because it looks like the tail on a horse. Instead of having uh, the actual tube of the spinal cord, you have individual neurons basically just hanging there. It looks like the hair from a horse's tail. That's why it's called the cauda equina, or horse's tail. This will just kind of dangle loosely and kind of floats around in a bath of the cerebral spinal fluid. The spinal cord has uh, two widened areas at the cervical region and at the lumbar region. And these contain uh, neurons for the upper and lower limbs, uh, respectively. Uh, that's why if you've ever had a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap, that's why this is done at the lumbar region of the spinal cord, because it gets wider. So it's easier to draw the fluid from there. And whenever you're dealing with the spinal cord, the more room you have to work, the better. All right, here's the spinal cord going from the very top region to the cervical area then to the thoracic area, the lumbar, and the sacral regions. The actual spinal cord itself ends here in the middle of your lower back, L2. And at this point, it's called the conus medullaris, this end point. You'll still get a plexus of nerves beyond that point. That's called the cauda equina, or the horse's tail, that float freely in the cerebral spinal fluid. All right, because it's so important, the, you know, the brain and the spinal cord have uh, multiple layers of protective membranes, and they're called meninges. So whenever someone has meningitis, it's one of these layers that's being uh, infected. Now, the meninges also act to set up a, a shock absorber and a cushioning system around the cord and the brain. Uh, there are three distinct layers of the meninges. Uh, the outer layer is the thick uh, fibrous tissue. This is called the dura mater. This is what you'll find on the inside of the skull, lying the periosteum of the skull. The middle layer is a, a delicate, uh, downy-looking layer called uh, the arachnoid mater, and it's called that because it looks almost like a spider web. It looks very thin, it looks very delicate, but it's made up of collagen and uh, elastic fibers. These act as a shock absorber. This area will also help transport uh, dissolved gases and nutrients, as well as uh, waste products. And the innermost layer, the third layer, which is fused directly to the brain and directly to the cord itself is the pia mater. This will contain the blood vessels that serve the brain and the spinal cord directly. Uh, there are a series of spaces that go along with the meninges. Uh, between the dura and the vertebral column is a space filled with fat and blood vessels called the epidural space. So whenever a, a woman who is in labor receives an epidural injection to alleviate the pain, this is where that needle goes into. The space between the uh, the vertebrae itself and the dura mater, so epidural space. Now, the, between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater is a subdural space filled with uh, a little bit of fluid. Between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater is a large subarachnoid space. It's filled with uh, cerebrospinal fluid that will act as a fluid cushion. Your brain basically floats in a, a pool of the cerebrospinal fluid. Now, these three uh, membrane layers and their fluid filled spaces together with the bones of the skull and uh, the vertebral column, form a very strong protective system against central nervous system injury. As you can imagine, the spinal cord and the brain are incredibly important to your overall function, so they should be protected as much as possible. There's an image of the brain inside the skull. We'll zoom in just on this one area here. Upper part here will be the inside lining of the skull, inside lining of the cranium. The layer of Meninges that touches directly the inside of that skull will be the dura mater here, the spider web looking area, the arachnoid mater, and then directly contacting the brain itself, or the, the pia mater. You're looking at it from uh, this view here, the spinal cord and the vertebrae here. The, the cord will be here in the lower portion of this image, the vertebrae will be at the back. You have the epidural space. We have a lot of uh, adipose or fat tissue. Then you have the dura mater. Then you have a subdural space, then the arachnoid mater, subarachnoid space, then the pia mater, and then the spinal cord. All right, next, we'll talk about the internal anatomy of spinal cord. Now, the spinal cord is divided in half by an anterior median fissure called a deep groove, and also a posterior median sulcus called a shallow groove. Now, the interior of the spinal cord is further divided into a series of sections of white matter columns and gray matter horn. 
there are three types of horns. These are regions where the neurons' cell bodies uh, are found. You have the dorsal horn. These are involved with the sensory functions. You have the ventral horn, which is involved in motor functions. And the lateral horns, which are dealing with autonomic functions. The columns, this is the area that you'll find white matter. These are axons that have myelin on them. In the ascending pathway, you have information going from your senses going up to your brain. So information is going or traveling up to your brain or arriving at the brain. Within this pathway, you have the dorsal column tract. This will carry uh, fine touch and vibration information to the cerebral cortex part of the brain. You also will have the spinal th uh, thalamic tract. This will carry information about temperature and pain and very basic crude uh, touch information to the cerebral cortex. You also have the spinal uh, cerebellar tract. This will carry information about posture and your body's overall position to the cerebellum. All right, that covers information going uh, up to the brain. Now going the other way, going in the descending pathway, which will carry motor information uh, from the brain out to the rest of the body. You have the corticospinal tract, which will carry orders from the brain to motor neurons in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. You also have the corticobulbar tract, which will carry orders from the brain to the motor neurons of the brain stem. You also have a reticulospinal, a rubrospinal, uh, among others. These will carry information which help coordinate movement from the brain to the brain stem and then to the ventral horn of the spinal cord. Now the left and right halves of the spinal cord are connected by commissures, uh, both gray and white. And these will allow the two sides of the central nervous system to talk to each other. Now, in the center of the spinal cord is a cerebral spinal fluid filled cavity called the central canal. Now the spinal roots will uh, project from both sides of the spinal cord in pairs. And these will fuse together to form the spinal nerve. Uh, the dorsal root with embedded dorsal root uh, ganglion will, is a collection of sensory neurons and will carry sensory information while the ventral root will carry motor information. I guess if you were to zoom in on this one area of the spinal cord, they have the multiple layers of the meninges of the cord, dura mater, rachnoid mater, pia mater, if you're cut this in cross section, this is just this up here. You have the, you have the anterior gray horn here, and the posterior gray horn here. You have a very standard butterfly looking appearance of the gray matter. And the white matter would be everything around it. So you're looking at it from this angle. The dorsal gray horn here, lateral horn here, uh, ventral or anterior gray horn here. The fissure right here in the middle, the anterior median fissure. The, the dorsal root ganglion here, which will merge and form the spinal nerves. The dorsal root, ventral roots up here. All right, now we'll talk about uh, another pathology connection. We'll talk about polio and the post-polio syndrome. Uh, polio is a paralysis that's caused by the uh, poliomyelitis uh, virus. This was common prior to the start of large-scale vaccinations in the 50s. And now it is extremely rare. Uh, symptoms, 99% of all patients suffer only mild upper respiratory or digestive illnesses, which typically only last just a few days. Symptoms, uh, only 1% of the patients will develop the paralytic form. And what happens is the virus will kill motor neurons in the ventral horn region of the spinal cord. So the cell death will result in paralysis. And we're talking about death of the motor neuron. So the movement is what is uh, affected. The sensation, or the sensory neurons, remain perfectly fine. The patients who have this form are still able to sense and feel things, but they just can't move limbs. A treatment and prognosis. Uh, there's no cure for polio. Uh, treatments are kept alive during the acute phase. Uh, if they do survive, they are going to need extensive uh, rehab. And 25% of the patients who develop paralytic polio will suffer a permanent disability. Uh, Post-polio syndrome, or PPS, is a progressive weakness that appears uh, several decades after the initial polio infection. This will affect uh, 25 to 40% of the patients with paralytic polio. And the cause of this could be related to the damage that's left behind by the polio virus. Now, in parts of the spinal cord damaged by the original infection, 
neurons are actually destroyed. Now, patients may recover function by using the few surviving motor neurons to power all of their muscles. Now, the current thinking is that surviving neurons become severely overworked and eventually will begin to die themselves. The diagnosis really consists of ruling out other causes of progressive muscle weakness in polio survivors. You can't always assume it is going to be PPS. Uh, the treatment, there's no way to stop the progression of PPS. There are ways you can help to improve the muscle function, such as exercise. All right, now we'll go into uh, spinal nerves. These are the nerves that are the connection between the central nervous system and the world outside of the central nervous system. So these are a part of the peripheral nervous system because they are branching off of the cord itself. All nerves will consist, will consist of bundles of axons and blood vessels and connective tissue. Now these nerves will run between the central nervous system and organs or tissues and carrying information into and out of the central nervous system. Nerves that are connected directly to the spinal cord are called spinal nerves and they're named for the core segment which they're attached to. And all spinal nerves are going to be what are considered to be mixed nerves. Now, some nerves carry only motor information, some nerves carry only sensory information, but some do both. That's what spinal nerves are. They're called mixed nerves. They carry both sensory and motor information. Now spinal nerves of the thoracic uh, spinal column uh, project directly into the thoracic body wall without branching. Now, other spinal nerves will branch extensively now, recombining with nerves from other spinal cord segments before projecting into a peripheral structure. And these complex branching patterns are called uh, plexuses, or a plexus is a singular form. For example, you have the cervical plexus, brachial plexus, and lumbosacral plexus. So for the cervical plexus, you have spinal nerves uh, from C1 to C4 all merging together. It forms a network of interconnected spinal nerves. So, that, so you have that in the brachial region, and you have that in the uh, lumbosacral region also. All right, now we'll get into uh, reflexes. This is the simplest form of motor output that you can make. These are generally protective, keeping you from harm. You know, if you think if you were to grab something very, very hot, you immediately pull away. That's a reflex. It was preventing you from holding on to something that's hot for too, too, too long. These are involuntary. And we'll usually get a larger response the larger the stimulus is. So the hotter the uh, pot on the stove is, the more of a reflex and response you'll have with your hand jerking back. Now some uh, familiar reflexes are the vestibular reflex, which helps keep you vertical, and the startle reflex, which is why you jump whenever you hear a very loud sound. As something that's involuntary, you can't control that as a reflex. Now the amazing thing about reflexes it's receiving sensory information and you're responding to that information through motor function, but it's not involving your brain. It only involves the spinal cord. That's why it can happen uh, so quickly. So not all information that you deal with on a daily basis is processed by your brain. Some gets processed just by the spinal cord. All right, now we'll talk about some common disorders of the nervous system. Uh, we'll break this up into parts. Uh, for part one, we'll talk about uh, peripheral uh, neuropathy, uh, spinal trauma, uh, Guillain-Barre, myasthenia gravis, uh, botulism, uh, meningitis, and carpal tunnel syndrome. Right, the first one, uh, peripheral neuropathy, is a family of disorders that involve uh, damage to a peripheral nerve. Uh, some symptoms, because the peripheral nerves are involved uh, in sensory and motor and autonomic functions, symptoms can vary greatly among patients. Some common symptoms, uh, muscle weakness, uh, decreased reflexes, uh, numbness, tingling, uh, paralysis, pain, uh, difficulty in controlling blood pressure, or abnormal amounts of sweating, or digestive abnormalities. Uh, some causes of peripheral neuropathy could be due to trauma. This is the most common overall cause of peripheral neuropathy. You know, anything that can cause a mechanical injury to nerves, such as a fall or a break or an automobile accident, you know, can cause damage to the nerves themselves. It can also be caused by uh, systemic diseases, such as uh, diabetes most common systemic cause of peripheral neuropathy. This is the reason why people who are diabetic need to keep track of uh, how well they maintain their feet because it's very easy for them to lose sensation in the feet, which is why many diabetics end up losing a foot or end up losing a leg 
because the, the lack of sensation, you don't know if something's wrong in your feet or in your legs. So you may be injured and never know it because the nerves aren't sending information to your brain because the nerves are damaged. Other, other systemic diseases that can cause this uh, condition, uh, kidney disorders, uh, hormonal imbalances, alcoholism, uh, vascular damage, uh, repetitive stress, uh, chronic inflammation, uh, various toxins, uh, tumors. All these are examples of systemic diseases that can lead to uh, peripheral neuropathy. And this can also be caused by infections and some autoimmune uh, conditions, such as uh, shingles, uh, Epstein-Barr virus, uh, herpes, HIV, uh, Lyme disease, polio. Another potential cause for peripheral neuropathy is a genetic cause called Charcot-Marie-Tooth disease, or CMT. The diagnosis, uh, based on a history of symptoms uh, and the presence of other conditions that may cause neuropathy. Uh, there are some diagnostic testing that could be done, MRIs, uh, CTs, uh, EMGs, and biopsy uh, treatments. The treatment is to address the underlying cause of the condition, and the symptoms are managed with uh, medications and therapy. Right, spinal cord injury, uh, most common causes uh, violence or a fall or a car accident or injury at work or disease. Half of all spinal cord injuries occur in people between 16 and 30 years old. Most of these injuries will be in males. And we have approximately 10,000 spinal cord injuries in the United States per year. There are various types of injury at the spinal cord, depending on how severe the damage is. You can have a, a severing of the spinal cord, either partial or complete. There can be a crushing of the spinal cord. You can also have a bruising of the spinal cord. The expected outcome, uh, bruises to the spinal cord uh, may resolve with time and rehab, but a crushed spinal cord or a severed spinal cord usually results in permanent injury. Let's see, mechanism of tissue injury. Uh, the initial injury will traumatize the spinal cord, and the body's response to the injury often furthers the tissue damage. So you get uh, the swelling of the spinal cord, you get a decrease in blood flow, you have the immune system that will remove and demyelinate some of the surviving tissue. The excess neurotransmitter uh, release will kill the cells locally, and the damaged neurons will self-destruct. So not only is the injury bad enough, but how your body responds to injury can make a spinal injury worse. Some symptoms of spinal cord injury, uh, paralysis or the sensory loss below the injury. The extent of the body uh, affected depends on the location of the injury. So for those people that have a damage in the cervical region of the spinal cord, uh, patients will become uh, quadriplegics. That means they are paralyzed in all four limbs. Uh, some patients will have a paralysis of the diaphragm, so they'll need, uh, need assistance in breathing. And also a sensory perception is also lost below the injury. So wherever the spinal cord is damaged, from that point down will be affected. For thoracic and lumbar injuries, uh, patients may become uh, paraplegic or paralyzed in just the legs. Uh, patients who experience uh, paralysis of the abdominal muscles may have difficulty uh, taking a deep breath or coughing. And then sensory information is lost below injury is here with here also. The sexual function is usually preserved. In males, the penile erection is a reflex, so that can still happen normally. Uh, the ejaculation may be impaired, but the sperm are still normal and can be used for conception uh, with medical intervention. In women, uh, the menstrual cycle may be abnormal due to the changes in hormones uh, post-injury. However, many women will remain uh, fertile. So even though the menstrual cycle may be abnormal, the women are still able to remain fertile and they're still able to carry a child with adequate medical supervision. Diagnosis of a spinal cord injury, uh, neurological exams testing sensory and motor functions, uh, imaging studies such as CTs or MRIs or x-rays or myelography, which is an x-ray of the spinal cord using a, a particular type of, type of dye. A treatment of a spinal cord injury. Uh, in the acute stage, uh, clinicians attempt to uh, prevent any further damage to the cord. So the injury will be immobilized, uh, respiration is aided, and low, low blood pressure and cardiac problems are treated. It also will give drugs to reduce the damage caused by inflammation and caused by cell death. And injury may be uh, permanently stabilized using surgical techniques. And after this acute stage, uh, clinicians will try to treat or prevent any long-term problems.
such as uh, respiratory uh, difficulties, abnormalities of blood pressure, uh, pneumonia, blood clots, uh, organ dysfunction, uh, pressure sores, uh, pain in general, and also uh, bladder and bowel dysfunction. Now, in some cases, extensive and vigorous rehab exercises can help uh, spinal cord injuries uh, recover some function. And other aspects of rehab include the patient learning to cope with dealing and living with the injury. Right, now I'll talk about the brain and the cranial nerves. Of course, the brain acts as the main processor and the overall director of the nervous system. Now, cranial nerves will leave the brain and go mainly to uh, specific body areas where they receive sensory information and bring that information back to the brain to be processed. Of course, the brain will be on top of the spinal cord, beginning at the level of the uh, frame and magnum, and the opening at the base of the skull, and filling the entire cranial cavity. The brain is divided into several anatomical and functional sections. The brain consists of the uh, cerebrum, the larger part of the brain, uh, the cerebellum, and then the brain stem. The cerebrum, uh, largest part of the brain, this is the part that is divided into right and left hemispheres. This is divided in half by uh, longitudinal fissure, and then divided from the cerebellum due to a transverse fissure. Now, the surface of the brain is not smooth at all. It's very bumpy, has many grooves and many ridges. Uh, the ridges are called uh, gyri, for plural. The gyrus is singular, but gyri is plural. And you have a series of grooves called sulci, and collectively these are known as uh, convolutions. And these convolutions serve a very important purpose because they increase the surface area in the brain so you can pack more brain into a smaller space. Now most of the sulci are extremely variable in their locations among humans but a few are in basically the same place in almost every brain and these will help to divide the brain into various lobes. Now the lobes are follow the naming of the bones of the skull which they are found under. So the frontal lobe of the brain is found underneath the frontal bone of the skull. Yeah, the temporal lobe corresponds to the temporal bone of the skull. Occipital lobe of the brain corresponds to the occipital bone of the skull. Parietal, parietal bones of the skull. Now the most anterior lobe is separated from the rest of the brain by the central sulci. These are called the frontal lobes because they are in the front of the brain. These are responsible for uh, motor activities, uh, conscious thought, and speech. Now just behind the uh, frontal lobes are the parietal lobes. These are involved with uh, body sense perception, uh, primary taste, and also speech. Posterior to the parietal lobes are the occipital lobes. These are responsible for vision. And the most inferior lobes, which are separated from the brain by the lateral sulci, are the temporal lobes. These are involved with hearing and the integration of emotions. And there's a section of the brain called the insula, which is found deep inside the temporal lobes. It's often listed as a fifth lobe, but it's not visible uh, just looking at the surface of the cerebrum. Now, much of the information coming into the brain is contralateral, which means the right side of the body is controlled by the left-hand side of the cerebral cortex, and vice versa. So these, the neurons actually, as they go up into the spinal cord to the brain, will crisscross. Here are some images of the external brain anatomy and the various lobes. Looking at it from this for the front, this for the back, and the longitudinal fissure here, separating the left and right hand side of the brain. Alright, this part here, the larger part of the brain, will be the cerebrum. And the different colors represent the various lobes. When it's in blue with the frontal lobe, because it's facing the front of the skull here. They have the central sulcus here, the parietal lobes, which is the side of the head, the flat side part of your head. On the very back of the, the head, the occipital lobe. And on the sides, just above your ears, the temporal lobe. All of that is the cerebrum. And on this image has the other two parts that we haven't talked about yet. The cerebellum and then the brainstem. All right, the cerebellum, uh, the structure is just posterior, the cerebrum. It's also divided into hemispheres by a raised ridge called uh, the vermis. The surface will be uh, very convoluted, just like that of the cerebrum. And just by looking at the external appearance of the cerebellum, you can see why it's called a little brain, 
and the structure of the brain is involved with uh, sensory collection, uh, motor coordination, and balance. Uh, here are a list of the uh, lobes of the cerebrum and what their major functions are. Of course, th these are just a very, very short list of what these uh, structures can do. And then cerebellum, what its main functions are. Now, the brainstem is a stalk-like structure that's inferior to and partially covered by the cerebrum. There are three regions of the brainstem. You have the medulla oblongata, which is a continuous with the spinal cord. This is responsible for impulses that will control heartbeat and respiration and the blood vessel diameter. It is this part of the brainstem that gets damaged when people are considered to be brain dead. If these centers that control these vital functions are destroyed, then your heart can't be on its own and you can't breathe on your own. You may be able to be kept alive by machines, and machines do that work for you. But if those machines are turned off, if this tissue isn't functional, then you are considered brain dead because there is no control, there's no autonomic control over those vital functions. Okay, just above the medulla oblongata, you have our second part of the three, uh, the pons. And just above that, you have the most superior part of the brain stem called the midbrain. And it's completely covered by the uh, cerebrum. Now here are the three structures of the brain stem and their main functions. And these three th together collectively are known as the brain stem, but there are three individual structures with different uh, functions for each. Such so as the midbrain will relay sensory and motor information. Uh, the pons will have a major role with breathing and also relaying uh, sensory and motor information. And then the medulla oblongata, where you find the vital functions controlled from heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, uh, reflex center for coughing and sneezing, uh, swallowing and vomiting also. And the brainstem will contain a reticular system, which is a diffuse network of uh, brainstem neurons responsible for waking up the cerebral cortex. So if you've ever had surgery and have been under a general anesthetic, this will inhibit the reticular system, causing unconsciousness. Now, injury to this reticular system can lead to a coma because you can't wake up, you can't gain consciousness. Now, the brainstem will receive sensory information and it contains control systems for vital processes such as blood pressure, heart rate, and breathing. Okay, here's an image of where these regions are of the brainstem. So we're talking about the spinal cord going up toward the brain. Uh, the most inferior part would be the medulla oblongata here. Just above that, you have the pons here, and just above that, you have the midbrain. And all that together is the brain stem. Now the brain, just like, just like the spinal cord, is covered with the uh, meninges. Now the meninges of the brain are continuous with the spinal cord meninges. And we mentioned earlier uh, in the video, uh, meningitis. This is an infection of the meninges, which is possibly a fatal condition that can spread rapidly and infect the brain and the spinal cord because of its common covering. Right, now we we'll talk about our next pathology connection. We'll talk about a brain injury. Uh, the first one, TBI, a traumatic brain injury. This occurs when you have force applied to the skull, causing damage to the brain tissue. Uh, some common causes of a car accident, which is the most common cause, uh, violence or various falls. It can also be caused by uh, sports injuries. Uh, damage that's similar to TBI can also be caused by a lack of oxygen or by a stroke, or by brain hemorrhage. Now there are roughly 100 cases per 100,000 people in the United States each year. Now 50% of accident or violence related TBIs involve alcohol. Now the riskiest ages for TBI are those under the age of five, uh, those between the ages of 15 and 24, especially for males, and over the age of 75. Now there are various types of traumatic brain injuries. First type, closed. This is where the skull is intact and the skull is not opened. And they have a penetrating TBI, where the skull is punctured by some object. Another type of brain injury, uh, stroke, is caused by a disruption of blood flow to a portion of the brain. Now, if oxygen is disrupted for long enough, the brain tissue will die. All tissues, no matter where they're found in the body, need oxygen to survive. Now, symptoms of a stroke can occur suddenly and will vary depending on the location of the brain involved. This can include uh, memory difficulties, uh, language difficulties, uh, sensory and motor difficulties. Strokes are often called uh, CVA, a cerebrovascular accident. Uh, 
Now this is a major stroke. This is where you have brain tissue uh, die due to insufficient blood, uh, blood supply. And the symptoms are largely permanent. And when someone has a stroke and they're unable to uh, move their left arm or their left leg or their side of their face is permanently paralyzed, that's because of a major stroke. That's a CVA. Another kind of brain injury is a TIA, a transient ischemic attack, often known as a mini stroke. And these patients have uh, stroke like symptoms, but these are symptoms that are temporary. And these can be a precursor to a major stroke that's impending. The hematoma, this is a pool of blood that's found between any of the layers of the meninges and the skull itself. Uh, some common locations are epidural hematomas, which are found between the dura mater and the skull, the subdural hematomas, found between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater, and the subarachnoid hematomas, found within the subarachnoid space. Now a blow to the head can rupture uh, tiny blood vessels in the skull, causing them to bleed into one of these spaces. Now a stroke or a ruptured aneurysm, say a weak spot in a blood vessel inside the skull, can also lead to a hematoma. Now there are several techniques that are used to diagnose a brain injury. There's a scale called the uh, Glasgow Coma Scale. This is based on the patient's ability to open their eyes uh, when told, to, told so, the ability to respond verbally to questions, and to move limbs when requested. And the lower the number on the scale, the more severe the injury is. There are also some imaging techniques that can be used to diagnose a brain injury. Uh, CAT scans, MRIs, uh, PET scanning. These are used to pinpoint the location and severity of an injury and to help monitor its progression. The treatment of head injury, just like the treatment of a spinal cord injury, will involve both prevention of further injury and the treatment of any existing injury. Uh, just like the spinal cord, an injured brain will self-destruct due to an increased swelling and then cell death caused by the tissue's attempt to repair the damage. So not only are you dealing with the injury by itself, you're dealing with the body's response to that injury. Uh, here in this image, we have both an illustration and then a, a real image. The image on top, you have an embolism, which is a traveling blood clot refining its way up into the brain. That will lead to a CVA, a cerebrovascular accident, or a major stroke. And this area here is black due to the death of the tissue. This is a major stroke. All the tissue that's in this darkened color is now dead and can't be repaired. Yeah. The acute care of head injuries, the mobilization of the head, uh, st stabilization of the cardiovascular and respiratory functions, and monitoring the intracranial pressure. Uh, you can also have medications that, do de that will decrease the intracranial pressure. You can also have uh, surgeries to remove any blood clots or foreign objects or blood from the brain. Now, approximately 40% of brain injured people, even those with uh, mild injuries, will experience uh, post-concussion syndrome. So for several days or even weeks after the injury, the patient may experience dizziness or uh, headaches or irritability or memory or concentration problems, disorders with their sleep, uh, anxiety, and depression. And these conditions are usually temporary. All right, now move on to the internal anatomy of the brain. Uh, inside the brain, you'll have white and gray matter along with the hollow cavities that will contain the cerebrospinal fluid. Now, the white matter of the brain is surrounded by gray matter. A layer of gray matter surrounding white matter is called a cortex. And the cerebrum is called the cerebral cortex, and the cerebellum called the cerebellar cortex. And you also will find various islands of gray matter deep inside the brain. These little islands are called nuclei. Some examples of these would be the basal nuclei, which have a major role with uh, motor coordination. And also the limbic system is what will help control emotions and mood and memory. The inside of the cerebrum uh, reflects external anatomy. Uh, the lobes are very clearly visible. The frontal, parietal, uh, temporal, and occipital, and the insula, uh, further internal, are clearly visible. On either side of the central sulcus are two gyri. You have the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus. Uh, precentral is anterior to the central sulcus. The postcentral is just posterior to the central sulcus. All right, first we'll talk about the precentral gyrus. A location, uh, like we just mentioned, just anterior to the central sulcus and the frontal lobe. A uh, function contains a primary motor cortex. This is the region that controls uh, your body movements. Each portion of the primary motor cortex 
controls a very specific part of your body. So this creates a map of the body on the brain, sometimes called a motor uh, homunculus, or little man. The body parts that perform more finely coordinated movements, like the hands and lips, require a larger area on this map, the homunculus. So it's a way to show the connection between what part of the body is being controlled by what part of the brain. Uh, the postcentral gyrus, uh, location, just uh, posterior to central sulcus, and the parietal lobe uh, function. Uh, this will contain the primary uh, somatosensory cortex, which is the center for uh, processing sensory information. Now, each portion of the uh, somatosensory cortex gets uh, sensory input from a very specific area of the body. So this also creates a, a map of the body on the brain. The size of the body parts on this map is proportional to the amount of sensory input that it is providing. Some other frontal lobe structures in the premotor and prefrontal areas. These are areas that will plan movements before the movement actually occurs. Uh, Broca's area is the area of the brain that controls movements associated with speech. The somatic sensory association area. This will allow understanding and interpretation of sensory information. Uh, Wernicke's area. This will control understanding of speech. It's not just hearing what the word is, but actually understanding what is being said. See the corpus callosum? This is a collection of white matter that connects the left and right hemispheres. This connection allows for the cross-communication between the different sides of the brain. So many day-to-day -day activities, you know, walking, driving, require both sides of your body. So therefore, both sides of your body need to be well-coordinated. Right, in this image, we have the, the motor areas of the brain uh, with the homunculus. So for this image, the parts of the body that are larger require more motor movements. So that's why the hands are really, really large in comparison to the other parts of the body. And here you have the connection between what part exactly of the cortex corresponds to what part of the body. And here we have the uh, primary somatic sensory area. Again, this corresponds to what part of the body is being controlled or, and what corresponding section of the cortex it will be found. It also will give you a, a general view on that area of the brain is in control of. Now, frontal lobe, personality, and speech. Now, temporal lobe, hearing and smelling. Now, occipital lobe, vision. Now, cerebellum, the balance and the coordination. Now, parietal lobe, language area. All right, inferior to the cerebrum is a section of the brain that's not visible from the uh, external view. It's called the diencephalon. This consists of several parts, including the thalamus, uh, hypothalamus, a pineal body, and a pituitary gland. Now, the glands will represent an interface with the endocrine system. And when we do our video on the endocrine system, you'll see how vital those structures are to the endocrine system. Now, in the diencephalon, you'll find a number of nuclei that are part of the basal nuclei and the limbic system. All right here are the various structures of the diencephalon and its main functions. And again, we'll talk about the pituitary gland and hypothalamus in much more detail in the future video. But thalamus, don't relate any information going to the cerebrum. Uh, hypothalamus will regulate the pituitary gland. The pineal body is responsible for maintaining your body clock due to the secretion of melatonin. And then pituitary gland, the master gland of all your endocrine system. Now the external similarities between the cere cerebellum and cerebrum are also obvious internally as well. The cerebellum will have a gray matter cortex and a white matter center. And this is known as the, the arbor vitae, which means the tree of life in Latin. And when you look at it, it literally looks like a tree on the surface of the structure. And this type of structure is only found in the cerebellum. Now the cerebellum also has nuclei that will coordinate sensory and motor activity. So essentially, the cerebellum fine-tunes the voluntary skeletal muscle activity and will help in maintaining the uh, balance of that person. All right, now we'll talk about another pathology connection. We'll talk about Alzheimer's disease. It's a progressive degenerative disease of the brain, which will cause memory loss and diminishing a cognitive function, or dementia. And etiology is unknown, but age is the most important risk factor. The older you are, the more likely that you will develop this. Symptoms will begin gradually. A mild forgetfulness gradually progress into severe forgetfulness, not knowing if you had lunch that day, uh, difficulty speaking, uh, reading, writing, uh, maintaining basic personal hygiene. As the condition will get worse, the patient will experience uh, personality changes, uh, anxiety, anger, uh, aggressiveness, apathy. Uh, there is no cure for Alzheimer's, unfortunately. There are some medications that will slow the progression of the early and middle stages, but there is no way to get rid of it. You can manage it if it's caught and diagnosed early enough. All right, now we'll move on to the cerebrospinal fluid and the ventricles of the brain. Uh, the ventricles, these are cavities inside the brain that are filled with uh, cerebrospinal fluid. 
These are continuous with the central canal of the spinal cord and also of the subarachnoid space. There are four ventricles in the brain. The lateral ventricles, uh, ventricles number one and number two, are in the cerebrum. The third ventricle is in the diencephalon. And the fourth ventricle is in the inferior part of the brain between the medulla oblongata and the cerebellum. All right, next let's talk about uh, cerebrospinal fluid uh, circulation. The CSF is filtered uh, from the blood in ventricles uh, by tissues called the choroid plexus. And the CSF is made in the lateral ventricles. It will flow through tiny openings into the third ventricle and then through another opening into the fourth ventricle. So this fluid will then flow into the central canal of the spinal cord and the sub subarachnoid space. And then this fluid gets returned to the blood via special ports between the subarachnoid space and the blood uh, spaces in the dura mater. So there's a constant recycling of the fluid. It's constantly being made and used and reabsorbed and recycled. All right, now we'll talk about a pathology connection, uh, hydrocephalus. This is a condition where you get uh, too much cerebrospinal fluid uh, being made in the skull. Now, causes of this could include a blockage of narrow passages due to trauma, or it could be due to a birth defect, it could be due to a tumor, or a decreased reabsorption of CSF. If it's not reabsorbed, it's going to remain it's floating around in the brain, so it's going to build up more and more and more. That's going to cause uh, some changes in the intracranial pressure. Now, in some cases, can increase the pressure inside the skull. It can eventually crush the brain tissue itself if it gets too high. Other cases, there may be no obvious rise in pressure at all, or you have normal pressure or hydrocephalus. Some symptoms, you have an expansion in the skull, especially in infants, where the skull hasn't been uh, completely ossified yet. Uh, nausea, vomiting, uh, irritability. Uh, seizures and of course headaches it can also lead to blurred vision problems with your balance and coordination uh, sleepiness dementia personality changes a diagnosis for hydrocephalus uh, either ct or mri showing uh, the enlarged ventricles and also the monitoring of the intracranial pressure uh, treatments uh, can be treated with medications more commonly treated with a surgical placement of a shunt to drain the fluid away from the brain going to the heart or to the abdominal cavity there's an example if you have a, a blocked vessel here, a, a blocked aqueduct, and then the lesser amount of fluid being reabsorbed, it will just keep being built and built and built, and will cause the brain to swell, increasing the pressure. So you place in a shunt, and that will direct the excess fluid away from the brain, so not to interfere with any cognitive function. So hydrocephalus is literally water on the brain. And right, now we'll talk about the uh, cranial nerves. In order for the central nervous system to function, it must be connected to the outside world via nerves of the peripheral nervous system. So like the spinal cord has spinal nerves, the brain has nerves called cranial nerves. And the cranial nerves are like spinal nerves in which they are uh, both input and output pathways for the brain. But with the spinal nerves, you have 31 pairs of nerves, and cranial nerves are only 12. And all but two of these arise directly from the brain stem. When we talk about the overall function, uh, the spinal nerves were uh, mixed nerves, which means they dealt with the sensory and motor functions. But for the cranial nerves, that's not always the case. There are going to be some that are mainly sensory, there are some that are mainly motor, and some that are mixed, but not all. And in all cases, the cranial nerves are going to be much more specialized than spinal nerves. This will carry sensory and motor information for the head and face and neck, as well as uh, visual, auditory, smell, and taste sensations. We talked about uh, peripheral neuropathy earlier, and the damage to the peripheral nerves. But it's not just about the spinal nerves. You can have cranial nerves that are also subject to peripheral neuropathy. Now, symptoms will be seen on the face and in the head or in your special senses. You know, sense of vision, sense of hearing, uh, taste, and smell. Now, here are the, the formal names of each of the 12 cranial nerves. These are also pairs, so there's going to be a left and right for each of these and what their main functions are. And they're always written by their Roman numeral. So cranial nerve number one would be you no know, capital letter I for the Roman numeral one. No, number 10 would be X, because the Roman numeral for 10. So we have the olfactory, which is the smell, uh, optic, uh, vision, oculomotor, uh, movements of the eye, uh, trochlear, uh, other movements of the eye, uh, trigeminal, sensory information for the face, and then uh, being able to chew, the motor function for chewing, uh, say abducens, eye movements as well, uh, facial, the motor control of facial expressions, vestibular cochlear, balance, uh, hearing, and so on glossopharyngeal, uh, the sensory information for taste, uh, the movement of throat muscles, the vagus nerve, sensory information to the viscera uh, for taste, uh, autonomic heart and lung function, uh, accessory will include motor and sensory information for the voice box, the soft palate, uh, muscles of the neck, and number 12, hypoglossal, 
chief motor function is the tongue muscles. And here's where all 12 pairs of these are found. If you're looking at the under the side of the ring, number one here, two here, three, four, and they're all color coordinated based on what part of the brain they're found. Would it be the cerebrum, diencephalon, midbrain, pons, or the medulla? Right, here's the, an overall flow chart of the nervous system up to the point that we've talked about so far. The central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, the two major branches. And from there, the peripheral nervous system gets broken down into more subgroups, and the somatic and the autonomic nervous system. And from here, the autonomic is further broken down into the parasympathetic and the sympathetic branches. All right, now we'll talk about the uh, somatic sensory system. This will provide sensory input uh, for your nervous system. This is what allows you to feel the world around you. All of your sensory information, a touch, uh, vibration, pain, temperature, body position. So other special senses are carried on cranial nerves, but information for the somatic sensation comes into both the brain and the spinal cord. So to attach any kind of meaning to a sensation, it must get to the brain to be interpreted. So somatic sensory information will come to the spinal cord via the dorsal root, and it will synapse with the motor neuron in the ventral horn. And the same axon that carries information to the motor neuron further carries sensory information to the brain via tracks in the white matter of the spinal cord, so you can feel pain. There's a, a brief summary of the uh, spinal cord pathways for sensory information. Spinal thalamic, both lateral and anterior, uh, the dorsal column and the spinal cerebellar, what information they receive information from, and what part of the body, and where the information goes to, either the somatic sensory cortex or the cerebellum. Now, sensory information going into the brain from the dorsal column or the spinal thalamic tracts provides sensory information from the skin and the joints to a portion of the cerebrum called the primary somatic sensory cortex. Now, this is located in the postcentral gyrus of the parietal lobe. Now, axons will transport information to a specific part of the somatic sensory cortex that will correspond to parts of the body. So neurons, somatic sensory cortex, are neurons that allow you to have conscious sensations. Another area of the cerebral cortex that allows understanding and interpretation of the somatic sensory information is located just posterior to the SS cortex and the parietal lobe. And this is called the somatic sensory association area. Now, somatic sensory system works on a kind of hierarchy. Where sensory neurons and spinal cord and brainstem collecting information and then passing it on to areas of the thalamus, of the cerebellum, of the cerebral cortex to be processed. So your actual understanding of a complex sensory input happens only after information gets passed from a somatic sensory cortex and somatic sensory association areas. All right, now we'll talk about the uh, motor system. And the motor system is also set up in a hierarchy, you know, working in parallel with the SS system. Uh, with two obvious differences. Information moves in the opposite direction from the brain to the spinal cord. Because whenever you're involving the motor system in general, you're involving movement. So information will go from the brain out to the rest of the body. Uh, second, the motor system has two divisions, the somatic motor system, autonomic nervous system. The somatic motor system will control voluntary movements under orders from the cerebral cortex. Uh, in the frontal lobe, there are premotor and prefrontal areas, which will help plan movements. Now, plans from these two areas are sent to the primary motor cortex located in the precentral gyrus. Now, orders are then sent to the spinal cord directly and also to a number of coordination centers, including the thalamus, basal nuclei, and the cerebellum. Now, the plan for movement leaves the motor cortex and connects with neurons in the thalamus located in the diencephalon. Now, the thalamus, basal nuclei, and cerebellum are part of the complicated motor coordination loop. So here, movements must be fine-tuned. Uh, posture and limb position have to be judged, and other movements have to be turned off, and movement and sensation are integrated. Without this loop, movement would be uh, very uncoordinated, very inaccurate, very jerky, and most likely impossible. The cerebellum has both motor and sensory inputs and outputs from the cerebral cortex and the thalamus and the basal nuclei and the spinal cord. The cerebellum will get information about the planned movement and the actual movement and it compares plan to the actual. If the plan and actual movements don't match, the cerebellum can adjust the actual movement to fit the plan. So it's where you get the fine tuning of your movement. So the function of the cerebellum is subtle and still mysterious, but without the cerebellum, movements would be very 
jerky, very clunky, very inaccurate at best. Right, after movement information gets processed by the thalamus, the basal nuclei, and the cerebellum, it moves to the spinal cord and the brainstem via the corticospinal and the corticobulbar tracts. So both the corticospiral and the corticobulbar tracts from the motor cortex are direct pathways carrying orders from neurons in the brainstem to the ventral horn of the spinal cord. And pathways coming from the subcortical structures are considered indirect pathways because they help coordinate movement. And the function of the spinal cord pathway is to send orders from the brain to the motor neurons in the spinal cord and then the brainstem. Motor neurons in the spinal cord connect to skeletal muscles via the cranial nerves or by the spinal nerves, sending orders to skeletal muscles to carry out the planned movement or to coordinate ongoing movement. And the second function of the corticospinal and corticobulbar tracts is the fine tuning of reflexes. And these tracts will inhibit reflexes, making them softer than they would be if they had no influence from the brain. So just from these last few slides, the last few minutes, the functionality of movement going from the brain or being processed by the brain, signals being carried out through skeletal muscles for the actual process of movement, fairly complicated and pretty involved and involves a lot of moving parts working all at the same time working together. All right, now we'll talk about another pathology connection, talk about some uh, motor pathologies. Uh, the first one, cerebral palsy, or CP. It's a permanent, non-progressive set of motor uh, deficits, usually diagnosed in infants and young children. It's generally thought to be due to damage in uh, the motor cortex. Uh, some risk factors of cerebral palsy, uh, low birth weight, premature birth, or having multiple births, uh, an infection during pregnancy, developmental abnormalities, brain hemorrhaging, uh, prenatal uh, brain injury, uh, lack of oxygen, childhood illness. Symptoms of CP can vary. It can include uh, increased muscle tone, uh, overactive reflexes, a lack of coordination of voluntary movements, and uh, foot dragging. Uh, other symptoms can include uh, drooling or speech difficulties, fine motor problems, uh, tremors, and other uncontrollable movements. And many patients with uh, CP are average or above average intelligence. So cognitively, they're fine. It's just the motor functions that are impaired. Diagnosing of CP could consist of observing childhood motor skills and looking for developmental milestones, uh, imaging such as a CAT scan or MRI, and also ruling out other causes of other motor deficits. Treatments for CP, physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, assistive devices, uh, wheelchairs for examples, or braces, uh, drugs to control symptoms, but unfortunately there's no cure for cerebral palsy. Next one, PD or Parkinson's disease, is a chronic progressive motor disorder uh, characterized by a resting tremor, uh, slow movements, uh, impaired balance, rigidity, uh, fatigue, uh, emotional and cognitive disturbances. And this is caused by a disappearance of dopamine neurons in one of the basal nuclei, which will later spread to the cerebral cortex. Now the reason why these neurons disappear is not known, but some reasons that have been suggested are uh, toxins, uh, viruses, mitochondrial uh, malfunctions, and genetics are possible causes. Diagnosis is based on history and the physical exam. There are some uh, specific physical exam findings in uh, people with Parkinson's, such as a, a shuffling gait as they walk, a cogwheel rigidity. This is when muscles seem to kind of catch and release when being moved, so it's not a, a fluid motion. It's a very jerkiness to being contracted and relaxing. There's like a, a cogwheel that gets stuck. And also the resting tremors. The imaging uh, is not terribly helpful with Parkinson's. Since, Moly, since most early stages of a PD will have perfectly normal scans. So you can't just rely on a CAT scan or, or MRIs. Uh, treatments for Parkinson's. Uh, dopamine enhancing drugs like L-DOPA, for example. But side effects could include hallucinations, excessive uncontrollable movements. And patients that are treated with L-DOPA tend to have periods where they're on and off, but those periods are going to be unpredictable. So it may be working fine for a while, but then it's not working for a while. And there's no way to control it, no way to predict that. Another way for another method of treatment for Parkinson's is a deep brain stimulation. Next one, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or Lou Gehrig's disease, is a rapidly progressive and fatal degeneration of the motor system. It occurs when uh, motor neurons in the cerebral cortex and the brainstem and the spinal cord basically self-destruct. And on average, a person will die within about five years of diagnosis, usually due to respiratory failure. 
This will usually begin between the ages of uh, 40 and 60. Uh, the first symptoms will appear as muscle weakness, uh, twitching, uh, cramping. This will progress to a complete paralysis, including difficulty even speaking or even swallowing. Eventually, the diaphragm will become paralyzed, which will force the, force the patient to become dependent on the ventilator. But the eye movements, uh, bladder, and bowel control usually is retained by the patient. Now, the cause of ALS is unknown, but some possible causes could be toxins or damage by free radicals or by mitochondrial problems may be involved. Now, in most cases, there seems to be an excess uh, activity of the neuroglial cells and excess production of the neurotransmitter glutamate, both of which will increase the neuron death rate. A diagnosis, there's no one clear definitive test for ALS. The one unique feature that can aid in diagnosing this condition is that patients will have both spastic and flaccid paralysis. Uh, imaging, uh, EMGs, uh, blood and urine tests are helpful to rule out other possible explanations. Uh, a neural biopsy may also be helpful. Uh, treatment for Lou Gehrig's disease, there is no cure, unfortunately. There are drugs that can help slow the, uh, the progression of the disease. There are drugs that can help decrease the pr production of uh, glutamate, thereby decreasing the rate of neuron cell death. And there are other treatments that can be used to improve the symptoms and improve the quality of life, but there's no, no definitive cure just yet. All right, now we'll move on to the autonomic nervous system. The peripheral nervous system is divided into two uh, subdivisions, the somatic nervous system, which controls the skeletal muscles, and the autonomic nervous system. That's what we'll talk about in this last section of this, of this chapter. And the autonomic nervous system controls you know, physiological characteristics such as blood pressure, respiration, heart rate, uh, sweating, and digestion. Stuff that happens automatically without your control. Now, neurons for the autonomic system, like the somatic motor neurons, are located in the spinal cord and in the brainstem and release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. This is where the similarities between these two end. Now the autonomic motor neurons are located in the lateral horn rather than the ventral horns. And unlike the somatic motor neurons, the autonomic neurons do not connect directly to muscle. Now they make a synapse in the ganglion outside the CNS called the presynaptic junction. Now then a second motor neuron called the postganglionic neuron connects to the smooth muscle or to a gland. There are no autonomic neurons in the cervical spinal cord at all. And the autonomic nervous system in general has two divisions of its own, the sympathetic and parasympathetic. And these two divisions will have exactly opposite effects from one another. First, we'll start with the sympathetic branch. This controls the flight or fight response, so how you respond in a, an emergency. And do you stick around and fight, or do you turn around and flee? So in this condition, you'll have you know, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, sweating, dry mouth, all because of the large increase of adrenaline. Now, the postganglionic neurons of this branch are located in the thoracic and the first two lumbar segments of the spinal cord. The preganglionic neurons, which secrete acetylcholine, synapse with the postganglionic neurons in these sympathetic ganglia. Now, the ganglia will form pairs of uh, chain-like structures that run parallel to the spinal cord, called the paravertebral ganglia, where neurons in the ganglia release the neurotransmitter norepinephrine. Most importantly, the sympathetic system stimulates the adrenal glands to release the hormone epinephrine, which causes the adrenaline rush. So you're able to deal with the emergency right then. Okay, the opposite of that would be the parasympathetic branch. It's often called the rest and digest branch. This will have the opposite effects of the sympathetic system. It's responsible for your normal everyday life. And it's also is important to kind of dial back down to normal the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. Or you don't want your heart racing all the time like you're in an emergency situation or your heart rate to be up constantly or your breathing rate to be up all the time. You need to find a way to dial that back down to normal. That's what the parasympathetic division does. So basically everything that the sympathetic nervous system does to you is undone by the parasympathetic. So a decreased heart rate, lowered respiration rate, lower blood pressure, increased digestion levels, uh, increasing stomach activity. Now the neurons for the parasympathetic system are in the brainstem and in the sacral spinal cord. And the neurotransmitter acetylcholine is released by the postganglionic neuron. Right, here's a summary uh, or a comparison side by side, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Some big differences here. The parasympathetic are found in the cervical and the sacral regions, which is different from the sympathetic, which are found in the thoracic and lumbar regions of the spinal cord. In this chart, you also find the 
the sympathetic and parasympathetic effects on various organs, you know, like the heart, like the lungs, the eyes, and urinary system, and so on. Another big difference, the lengths of the preganglionic and postganglionic fibers are going to be different based on where their target organs are. You know, for example, for sympathetic, their preganglionic neurons are going to be relatively short, but really, really long postganglionic neurons. The opposite will be true for the parasympathetic. Really, really long preganglionic neurons and relatively short postganglionic neurons. And then the big difference here, the final neurotransmitter used on the target cell by the sympathetic nervous system will be norepinephrine. The final neurotransmitter that acts on the target cell for the parasympathetic will be acetylcholine. We'll recap some uh, diseases of the nervous system. Uh, the first one, multiple sclerosis, MS. Etiology is an autoimmune attack on the myelin coating in the central nervous system. Uh, signs and symptoms will vary depending on the location of the plaques. Uh, it could be sensory, it could be motor, it could be cognitive. A diagnostic test, uh, patient history, and then imaging, and then finally the locations of the, of the plaques. Uh, treatments could include steroids or immunosuppressant drugs or a plasma exchange or just managing your symptoms. Uh, Guillain-Barre, etiology is autoimmune uh, destruction of the peripheral nervous system, myelin, often after a viral infection. Uh, some signs and symptoms, usually a rapid onset of ascending paralysis. The diagnostic test, personal history, EMG, spinal tap. Uh, treatments, there are no real treatments available, but you can have a supportive care and sometimes a plasma exchange. Charcot-Marie-Tooth disorder, CMT, the genetic disorder, or genetic destruction, of the peripheral nervous system, myelin, and or the axons. Some signs of CMT, uh, ascending muscle weakness and atrophy, and a decreased sensation in those affected limbs. Some diagnostic tests, uh, EMG history, uh, biopsy, genetic testing. Some treatments, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, surgery, pain medication, uh, symptom management, but there's no known treatment that is able to stop the deterioration. Myasthenia gravis, uh, etiology, autoimmune attack on uh, acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junctions. Some signs and symptoms is a, a progressive fluctuating muscle weakness, often starting with the facial or the eye muscles. Uh, diagnostic testing, uh, blood tests, uh, EMGs, uh, treatments could include steroids or immunosuppressants, uh, plasma exchange, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. Polio, etiology here, uh, destruction of the ventral horn of the motor neurons by the poliomyelitis virus. Some signs and symptoms, uh, muscle weakness, Diagnostic testing uh, is a sudden onset of, of paralysis after uh, having flu-like symptoms, and it's rare in the United States. Treatments will include supportive care until the virus will just run its course, and then therapy after that to regain strength and damaged muscles. A post-polio syndrome uh, etiology is a very late onset fatigue of motor neurons originally affected by polio. This could be decades after the initial infection. Uh, signs and symptoms, uh, muscle weakness, in a patient with a past history of paralytic polio. Uh, diagnostic test, you need to rule out any other possible causes of uh, muscle weakness. Uh, treatments, there are no treatments, but there are some, there's some evidence that vigorous exercise may be able to help. Spinal cord injuries, uh, etiology, usually a mechanical injury to the spinal cord tissue. Uh, signs and symptoms, the loss of sensory and motor function. Of course, it will depend on the location of the injury. A diagnostic test, uh, neurological exams and imaging. Uh, treatments uh, for an acute treatment, you want to prevent any further injury. So that would, that would include uh, steroids or immobilization. For long-term care, uh, physical and occupational therapies, uh, supportive care, and then symptom management. Uh, peripheral neuropathy, uh, etiology. This is damage to the peripheral nerves to do either an illness or injury. Uh, signs and symptoms, uh, motor and uh, sensory abnormalities, including weakness or pain, or numbness or a tingling feeling. A diagnostic test, uh, imaging, biopsy, uh, patient history. Uh, treatments would include you know, management, uh, treatment of the underlying disorder that's causing the nerve damage. Uh, traumatic uh, brain injury, etiology, uh, damage to the brain tissue due to a mechanical injury or a lack of oxygen or brain hemorrhage. Signs and symptoms, this will vary greatly depending on the uh, severity of the injury and on the location. It could range anywhere from a dizziness to nausea to severe cognitive disturbances, memory loss, uh, seizures, and unconsciousness. Uh, diagnostic testing 
uh, using the uh, Glasgow Coma Scale, uh, imaging techniques also, uh, treatments. Uh, the acute treatment is to prevent further injury, such as mobilization, uh, surgery, medication, and to relieve the, the pressure. Uh, Long-term care would include physical therapy, occupational therapy, supportive care, and symptom management. Hydrocephalus, uh, etiology, we have an excess amount of cerebrospinal fluid in the brain due to a birth defect or trauma or tumors, etc. Signs and symptoms will vary with age. You can have skull expansion and irritability in babies. You can have irritability uh, or vomiting or seizures or sleepiness and dementia in patients who are older. Diagnostic testing, uh, imaging, and of course um, pressure monitoring. And for treatments, uh, insertion of a shunt to redirect the excess uh, fluid away from the brain. And cerebral palsy, uh, etiology, uh, risk factors include you know, having a premature birth, having low birth weight, uh, developmental abnormalities, perinatal brain injury, uh, signs and symptoms, and non-progressive uh, motor deficits in young children. Uh, diagnostic tests, uh, these are difficult. Basically, you're, you just need to observe the childhood um, motor skills and rule out any other possible disorders that it could be. Uh, there's no cure, but you can use physical therapy, occupational therapy, you know, assistive devices, and symptom management. Uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, etiology, is a, is a progressive loss of dopamine. Common signs and symptoms, uh, resting tremors, uh, slow movement, rigidity, uh, cognitive and emotional disturbances. Diagnostic tests, uh, history, or imaging, uh, neurological exams. Uh, treatments, there's no cure yet, but some treatments could include uh, dopamine-enhancing drugs, symptom management, and then also deep brain stimulation. Huntington's disease, etiology, this is a genetic disease. It's a progressive loss of neurons from the basal nuclei and the cerebral cortex. Signs and symptoms, there's a midlife onset of uh, chorea, which is a neurological disorder that's characterized by uh, very jerky movements, and particularly of the shoulders and the face and the hips. Uh, mood swings, uh, memory loss, uh, this will progress to dementia and then eventually paralysis. The diagnostic tests, uh, family history, uh, imaging, and genetic testing. There's no cure for Huntington's, but there are some medications to help control the emotional and the motor symptoms. But there's no drug treatment for the dementia, however. The ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, etiology is a progressive loss of motor neurons in the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. The cause is unknown at this point. Signs and symptoms, a progressive muscle weakness, uh, twitching and cramping, which will eventually lead to uh, complete paralysis, even though the sensation is normal. Patients with uh, paralysis are still able to sense uh, sensory information in these limbs. They just can't move them. Diagnostic test, uh, there's no definitive diagnosis. The presence of having both flaccid and spastic paralysis is a good indicator of ALS. And of course, you also want to rule out any other possible disorders. Uh, there's no known cure for ALS, but some drug treatments have shown to slow the progression, and you can also manage the symptoms. The Alzheimer's disease, uh, etiology is not fully known, but it's believed to be a buildup of plaque in the brain and or a defect in the in a neurotransmitter within the brain. Some signs and symptoms, uh, varying degrees of confusion, memory loss, uh, cognitive defects, uh, personality changes. Diagnostic test, a history and physical exam, uh, interviewing uh, family members, and uh, some various uh, cognitive testing. No known cure for Alzheimer's, but there are some drug therapies that can prevent or decrease some of the symptoms if it's caught early enough. All right, we'll end this chapter with our uh, pharmacology corner. We'll talk about the blood-brain barrier. This is the barrier that will prevent or slow down the passage of chemical compounds and pathogens from the blood into the central nervous system. Now, it's believed to consist of walls of capillaries in the CNS by surrounding glial membranes, in particular the astrocytes. Okay, this is important to remember because some drugs that are beneficial can't easily pass through this barrier. The medications can affect the chemical synapses and their transmissions in multiple ways. Some medicines will bind to the neurotransmitter receptors and then mimic that effect of that neurotransmitter, such as uh, nicotine and tobacco, uh, opiates like morphine and heroin, uh, L-DOPA that's used to treat Parkinson's, benzodiazepines such as tranquilizers, and such as Valium, for example. All these drugs will attach themselves to a receptor and then mimic and act like they are a neurotransmitter. Now, some medicines will stop the removal of neurotransmitters from that synaptic cleft, thereby prolonging the neurotransmitter effect, such as uh, MAO inhibitors 
monoamine oxide inhibitors uh, for Parkinson's disease and uh, Nardil for depression. Uh, SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, like Prozac uh, for depression. These will stop the reabsorption or the reuptake of serotonin. So, ser so serotonin lasts longer in a synaptic cleft. Thereby, its concentration goes up and its effect goes up. So thereby alleviating depression. Acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, such as neostigmine for myasthenia gravis or RCEP for Alzheimer's. These also act to stop the removal of these neurotransmitters. So the concentrations will go up and their effect will last longer. And some medications will completely block neurotransmitter receptors, preventing the neurotransmitter from even having any effect at all such as acetylcholine receptor blockers for motion sickness and uh, muscle reluctance, and uh, beta blockers, which block norepinephrine receptors. If these receptors are blocked, then they can't work. You don't, de you don't develop motion sickness if you don't get the sense that you are moving. Your heart rate won't be as often if your heart isn't told to contract. The uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, carpal tunnel is a inflammation and a swelling of the tendon sheath that surrounds the flexor tendon of the palm. It's usually done due to a repetitive motion, such as typing on the keyboard all day, every day, and week after week after week. As a result of this inflammation, the median nerve gets compressed, producing a tingling sensation or numbness in the palm and in the first three of your fingers. And this is due to the, the typical layout of a standard keyboard. It causes you to bend your wrist inward or medially, which will compress the the tendons, which is why you get more tingling and more of the effect on your first three fingers. That's why you see many keyboards have, a, have taken more of an ergonomic design to them. So instead of bending your hands inward to type, your hands are, f are facing straight ahead. So the keyboard may be a little bit longer and seems to be broken in the middle. It's to prevent you from bending your hands the way you would on a normal keyboard. So less bending of the wrist and of the hands will cause less tension and compression on the median nerve. All right, that brings us to the end of this chapter on the nervous system. As mentioned, this was a pretty long, pretty involved chapter due to the content of the nervous system. There's just so much to cover, and we could have made it you know, a lot longer if we wanted to. So we will continue our anatomy series with our next video on chapter number 10.